Do you know what this is? Nobody really knows the mystery hidden behind this connector. Hey guys, my name is Daniele Tartaglia. I'm an Italian maker and I just love building cool stuff. Today we're going to take a look at, and actually build, the pinball assembly. The mechanism that shoots the ball into play in every pinball machine. But here's the thing, before I show you how I built mine, let's dive into this fascinating device because it hides a secret that most people have never heard of. It was Gottlieb, back in 1947, thanks to an idea by Harry Mabs that introduced the very first game with player-controlled flippers, Humpty Dumpty. The quick and snappy motion of those little bats gave players direct control over the ball, a true revolution at the time compared to the purely passive mechanical games. But those flippers couldn't be held like in modern pinball machines. The ball had to be hit on the fly. Just a year later, another pinball came out with the corrected mechanism, Triple Action by Genko. And believe it or not, it was Harry Mabs himself who made that modification, a change that soon became the standard still used in every pinball machine today. But how is a pinball assembly actually built? This is such a beautiful piece of engineering. What you see here is an original Williams assembly I salvaged from an old pinball machine and fully restored, even recreating the original coil sticker. Before building my own version, I want to show you up close and explain how this little masterpiece of mechanics works. This is a dual winding coil. It contains two separate windings. The three terminals belong to the two coils with a common lead. Here we have the 2.2 microfarad, 250 volt snubber capacitor. Its job is to eliminate sparks, also known as a suppression capacitor. It's wired in parallel with the switch contacts or across the coil terminals. And it absorbs the voltage spikes that occur when the coil's current is suddenly interrupted. This protects the mechanical switch contacts from wear or burning, and it also reduces electrical noise in the system. Most importantly, it safeguards the coil itself when it remains energized for long periods. Here's the leaf contact. It diverts the current from the power coil to the hold coil when the flipper reaches its maximum stroke. Without this system, the coil would stay fully energized, quickly overheating and burning out the winding insulation. And this is the maximum opening angle. This small rubber pad helps dampen the return click. Let me show you how it works. I trigger it with this button, powering it through the two outer terminals. Warning, this micro switch setup is not designed to drive coils directly. This is just a demonstration. But as you can see, the coil draws quite a lot of current. Just think of the force it takes to move a steel ball like this. But how is that even possible? Only 0.18 amps with such a relatively low voltage. In fact, the coil is completely cold. Let me show you a trick with this clamp. I'm going to force the contact formed by these two blades so it never opens when the pinball assembly is activated. Now I power the coil and look at the current draw, 5.28 amps. It would have been at least eight, but my power supply can't deliver more than five amps. And check out the voltage drop, completely free. Did you see the magic of that contact? Well, it's not really magic, it's logical switching. The current required by the coil to kick the ball with strength and speed is extremely high. But once the pinball assembly reaches its maximum opening, that contact opens, cutting off the power hungry coil and switching to the smaller one. Let's visualize it better with a graphic. There's only one coil, but inside it there are two separate windings. The larger winding, used for the powerful initial kick to launch the ball, and the smaller winding, used to hold the flipper bat in place. Of course, this is just a simplified representation, just to give you the idea. In reality, the two windings differ by wire thickness, number of turns, and their electrical characteristics, not by physical space inside the solenoid. Before I move on to building my own version, I want to thank JLCPCB for providing the materials to build this pinball machine. Take a look at the outstanding quality of all the PCBs that make up the programmed lighting system. Those psychedelic lights you see on the playfield, practically the entire set complete, some of them were even modified to fix a few design mistakes, and that's exactly why I recommend making your PCBs at home first, so you can test everything before starting production. JLC PCB is a company that produces professional PCBs and also offers component assembly at extremely low cost, with incredibly fast shipping times. And then there's JLC 3DP, their 3D printing service, which delivers top-notch quality. These are the pinball assembly bases that we'll be building in this episode, printed in matte black resin. And I noticed the dimensions were accurate down to a tenth of a millimeter. Two companies you should really consider for this kind of project, especially if you don't have CNC machines and you're looking for a service that's simple, affordable, and reliable. And the best part, if you're a new user, you can get a $70 coupon to try your first prints for free. Just click the link in the description or in the first comment. Don't miss it you could get high-quality 3D prints. 
Now that we have all this information, let's build our own flipper assembly. Unfortunately, we can't use the same switching mechanism we just saw, because dual winding coils are no longer available. So I came up with a DIY alternative that works in the same way. On AliExpress, I found the perfect coil. It's a bit limited in stroke, but it's strong enough to launch our ball. There are two versions, 12 volts and 24 volts. This one is the 12 volt model, complete with a return spring. But there are two problems we need to deal with. At 12 volts, it doesn't have enough power to launch the ball with real force, and it draws a lot of current. Almost two amps at 12 volts. The solution, power it at double the voltage, 24 volts. That way, the power doubles as well. Of course, so does the current. These coils are rated for a nominal current of around 400 milliamps, but here we're pushing close to 4 amps. If you leave them energized at that current, even for just a few seconds, they'll burn out very quickly. But here's the trick. If we lower the power supply to around 3 volts, once the coil reaches full stroke, it stays energized while consuming almost 10 times less. So, will this drastic current reduction still be enough to hold the flipper in place? Yes, and in fact, it's even harder to release. I've powered both versions, the 24V coil and this 12V one. The 12V coil is definitely snappier. Here's the circuit. Press the button and the MOSFET board switches ground to power the coil. The coil fires and when it reaches full stroke, it closes the micro switch contact. That, in turn, cuts off the 24V and replaces it with just 5 volts enough to hold the coil energized. Of course, there's also a flyback diode across the coil and a snubber capacitor across the contact to prevent arcing. All right, now that I've bored you with theory, let's build it. On my playfield, I've mounted four assemblies so I can check whether they collide with other elements. That's why you always need to work from a proper design. I placed four flippers to improve gameplay and fun. Some are forced into position because as you know, a pinball playfield is crowded with parts. Screws, coils, electronics, odd passages, and more. The entire 3D base you're about to see started as a 2D drawing I made in Coral Draw, then extruded in Fusion 360. I began with the base, then added a bushing with a red wheel for the locking screws. Through it runs a 5mm steel rod. On one side there's the flipper bat, and below there's the lever arm with its connecting plate. The solenoid plunger pushes this whole system. I printed the base in matte black resin, and the result was excellent. I also printed the flipper bat itself in two colors, white body and black lightning pattern. Since the first print came out so well, I went ahead and made three more identical pieces. I also printed the bushing for the 5mm rod, an essential component given its shape. Perfect fit. Now let's assemble the flipper. We need a 5mm steel rod. Not necessarily machined, but perfectly sized. The flipper bat has a slot inside to prevent the rod from rotating. So, of course, it won't fit at first. I take a file and cut the matching flat into the rod. Then I cut it to length and finish the bottom using a drill driver as a makeshift lathe. My drill lathe. Now it fits perfectly. If you don't have a heavy-duty vise like mine, you can force it in with a hammer. But with a proper vise, it's much easier. Check that the rod is perfectly square. Perfect. We start with the base, where I insert the bushing. This decorative ring hides the surface marks from machining. I secure both bushing and ring with four small screws. Now I insert the flipper bat. It's very important that there's no play and that it moves smoothly. Time to mount the coil. First I attach the connecting plate with a 3mm screw and lock nut. It will then connect to the lever arm. Before that, I insert a long screw into this hole, which is 0.4mm smaller than the screw's diameter. That way, when I thread it in, it creates its own forced thread. Once it's in place, you can already guess its purpose, to make the mechanism work exactly as intended. Now I connect the plate to the lever arm with a 3mm screw, threading it into the smaller hole. The mechanism works perfectly. Next, the coil needs to be mounted with two short M4 screws, to avoid damaging the coil wire. Since the screws were just 1mm too long, I added two washers as spacers. Now everything sits perfectly flush, you see? It's almost done. On AliExpress, I bought a whole bunch of rubber bands in different sizes and colors, but only one model worked. Thick enough, even if the height wasn't ideal. We'll make it work anyway. It needs to be cut to length and glued with special silicone superglue because finding the exact size was impossible. 
And here it is. Look how much better it looks with the rubber installed. As you can see, the flipper bat isn't locked yet and slips on the shaft. You need to tighten the screw firmly so it grips the steel rod. Now it's securely fixed. I mistakenly installed the 24 volt coil, but I'll replace it later with the proper 12 volt version. For now, let's test it. I power it up and it works great. Listen to that sound. I really like it. The other assemblies were made with JLC 3DP prints and the quality is much higher. Remember, the left and right flipper bats are mirrored, not identical. Also, I had the bushing printed in Teflon, the perfect material for this job, much more resistant to wear than PLA or other plastics. And since someone will definitely point it out, the plastic plate won't last long. So, again from JLC 3DP, I had one made in metal. I don't know what process they used, but in metal it's on a whole different level. One assembly was made entirely at home with a 3D printer, while the other was made with the JLC 3DP parts. They're identical, but I definitely prefer the second version. Much more professional and resistant, especially considering the heavy stress it has to endure. But wait, aren't we forgetting something? Yes. The micro switch contact that switches the line from 24 volts down to a much lower voltage. Remember? I'll skip the DIY steps and show you the finished result, mounted with this aluminum bracket. When the flipper bat reaches its full stroke, it activates the switch. And here they are. All four pinball assemblies complete. I'm really satisfied with the result, but I'll wait a little longer before calling it a victory. Let's do a quick test on this plywood. I drill two 11 mm holes to pass the pinball bushings. On the other side, I secure the bases, raising them off the surface with four nuts and four threaded screws. I insert the flipper bats into the lever arms. Before tightening, I check the alignment, then lock them with the screw. Now for a quick temporary wiring with two push buttons because I just can't wait to try them. I power them up and they seem to work perfectly. The feedback is very close to the original pinball assemblies. At this point, only one thing is missing, the ball. And it works great, even though I'm only powering at 15 volts. I didn't use the 24 volt supply because I don't want to burn the coils without the proper switching circuit. And also to avoid sparking at the push button contacts. I then raised the supply to 18 volts and the power increased significantly. To be honest, there's nothing on the play field yet. And the only goal is just to launch the balls around randomly without any real purpose. But I can assure you, it's fun even like this. When my daughter saw it, she immediately asked to try it. And she had a great time. But unfortunately, I had to turn it off because without the proper switching circuit, I was afraid of burning out the coils. But guys, I can't even imagine how amazing this pinball machine will be once all the elements I designed are in place. Ramps, hidden passages, suspended tracks, targets, and a full gameplay with seven levels. So I think we'll stop here for this episode. Guys, we've reached the end of this fourth episode. There's still so much more to build. The fifth episode will be really exciting. I'll be building the automatic ball return system, a mechanism made of two coils that takes care of putting the chrome ball back into play whenever we still have lives left. So don't miss it and make sure to leave a like if you're enjoying this series. A big hug and see you next time. Over the years, I've built many DIY objects that work perfectly and you can replicate them too. If you want, you can subscribe to this channel and when the community gets bigger, I might bring you even more beautiful and interesting projects. Give a like if you want more videos like this.